We think differently. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining today's uh, uh, session of Geneva Talks. We have a great pleasure to welcome a special guest coming from Barcelona, uh, from Union of Mediterranean. It is a secretary general of this organization, Nasser Kemal. Uh, although you've been approached with uh, his um, bi uh, biography, with his resume, I will just repeat a few things of this impressive career. Uh, so Secretary General is um, Egyptian national, is a top diplomat of Egypt. He served uh, as assistant uh, foreign minister and abroad he was posted practically on three, four continents altogether. Uh, among the last posts before he joined uh, Union of Mediterranean was uh, his post in France and directly from Britain where he served Egypt as uh, its ambassador. So during his um, ambassadorial ship in uh, France, he was part of actually creation of the organization itself. It was, if I'm not mistaken, a, a joint statement that was coming uh, uh, from the European and um, Middle Eastern partners uh, by 2008. So Excellency, without further ado, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear professor, for having me with you today. Uh, I'm indeed honored, especially when I look at the very prestigious list of uh, uh, previous uh, speaker, uh, I feel humbled uh, and honored by uh, your very kind invitation to address uh, uh, you and, uh, and uh, your uh, very prominent uh, student. Uh, and also thank you for your uh, extremely kind uh, introduction. I'm not sure if I deserve uh, the world experienced uh, and seasoned, but I hope, uh, uh, I, hope I am. Uh, I know that the topics of uh, those intervention goal are handling the issue of geopolitics and geoeconomy around the world. And I'm here today actually uh, to speak about the region uh, where uh, I serve uh, uh, in my current capacity as the Secretary General of the Union for the Mediterranean. Uh, in a year that is actually quite memorable, memorable for so many reasons, some are good and some are less uh, good. Uh, this year happens, or to be more accurate, last year uh, until the, uh, was we celebrated the 21st anniversary of the Euro-Mediterranean partnership that was launched in Barcelona in 1995. Of course, 1995 was a, was a completely uh, this event took uh, place in a completely different context. Uh, the region, the wider region, meaning Europe and the south, southern and eastern Mediterranean. Uh, this was the end of the Cold War. This was uh, the hope of peace uh, in the Middle East uh, and the beginning of a promising uh, peace process between Arab uh, and Israeli and Europe and the southern and eastern Mediterranean uh, saw the importance of building a framework of cooperation uh, by which uh, we create an area of shared prosperity uh, and they focus their energy and actually the declaration was clear on it that we need south and north of our common sea to work on three main baskets. One is the political and security dialogue, including at the time uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. The second was, of course, an economic and financial partnership, which meant, uh, 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 in short, access to the EU market uh, 
against necessary economic and I would rather say political uh, reform in the southern Mediterranean rim. And the third, bringing people together, and this was before we started speaking about the clash of civilization and the end of history and all of that, to start a social, cultural, and human dialogue and try to forge a partnership to bring our common understanding of our region, of its reality, and its needs uh, between the North and the South of the Mediterranean. One thing was not said, but was tacitly understood also, that against economic support, investments, opening of the markets, the South will try to adhere to the normative uh, promise uh, and system of value that is being, uh, that has been established in Europe uh, post Second World War. Maybe we will leave for the, 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 the question and answer session, and I would love actually to get into uh, that discussion. Uh, what has been uh, achieved and what has not been achieved and where uh, the difficulty, uh, uh, where and, and how can we deal with that uh, in the future. But I thought I should concentrate at least this part of my presentation on when where we are uh, today, uh, uh, especially at a very delicate and important uh, juncture. Uh, we are indeed, like the rest of the world, or even more than the rest of the world, facing unprecedented challenge, which should push us actually to rethink so many of the systems that we depend on and we take for granted. The pandemic has been a game changer, not only in terms of its health and economic implications, but in terms of so many other aspects of our way of, of conducting even foreign policy and multilateral uh, uh, diplomacy. I'm sure uh, you and your prominent students are quite aware of the social economic repercussions uh, of this crisis. I mean, one number uh, portrayed clearly where we are today. I mean, for every month of confinement, we are losing 2% of our annual GDP growth. This is frightening. So the economic impact alone is going to exceed by far the 2008 recession, which remains in the mindset of so many, especially European uh, colleagues, as one of the worst uh, economic or financial crises Europe and the world has faced uh, uh, in the last uh, few decades. It also, the pandemic, I mean, has exasperated, uh, has made, uh, uh, excuse me. Okay. The pandemic has also led to a worsening of pre-existing vulnerabilities and inequalities within and among our, 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 our countries. And by our countries, I meant North also and South of the Mediterranean. It has definitely also exposed some condition of fragility uh, that we've been dealing with before, but has become much more acute uh, 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 with uh, the pandemic. So dealing with that definitely needs a, a, a clear uh, plan and understanding and a clear set of priorities. And I dare uh, quote what the UN Secretary General 
uh, less maybe than 10 days ago, uh, has uh, defined as the priority who are extremely relevant for the world, which I feel and believe are even more relevant for our age. He defined 10, but I will quote six or seven of them. He talked about responding to COVID-19, obviously. He spoke also about starting an inclusive and sustainable economic recovery, definitely. And by sustainable, we will discuss that further because we cannot rebuild according to the same model that we have adopted in the last few decades. He talked about making peace with nature. And this is a very diplomatic way of saying that we are facing a climate emergency. He also talked about tackling poverty and inequality. And there is no place in the world where inequality within, as I said, our member states, I'm talking about the Euro Mediterranean region, or between our member states is more sharp than our region. He talked about gender equality, which is no longer an ethical challenge, it's an economical challenge, and it is extremely important to deal with if we want to unleash our true potential in terms of economic, political uh, development. And he, of course, talked about healing geopolitical rifts. And where else than the Middle East where political rifts are more apparent? So I dare say our region is or can be a laboratory in terms of applying those principles, implementing and focusing on this priority to see if we can advance our common project of forging what I said, a region of co-prosperity between North and South of the Middle East. We need to deal with, as I said, the inequality just a, a number here that is extremely relevant. The GDP of Southern Mediterranean country is 13 times lower than the GDP of the Northern part. This is a dangerous situation. Hence, migration, political tension, extremism, all, uh, all those, uh, all those challenges are definitely uh, 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 stems from this very stark uh, 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 inequality uh, between uh, the wealth uh, multiplier uh, in the north compared to the south. On the climate, I'm talking now about the region. We are living in a region that is warming 20% faster than the rest of the world. That's quite shocking, I have to say. And I'll come back to that uh, later on in my presentation. Uh, this is, an, if the world is facing a climate emergency, I don't really know what to call uh, what we are facing in our region because it is even much more acute and extremely more dangerous. And I can give you a few examples later in my presentation. The pandemic has made the situation even worse. worse because the health and wealth threat multiplier represented by climate change is especially intense over our Mediterranean region. And as I said, it has the tendency to increase and deepen the existing inequality and impacting, impacting vulnerable group, groups and economies in a very uneven and devastating way. We all know, for example, that communities that are unable to self-isolate 
due to poor housing will drive up infection rates. And we've seen it uh, in so many of our, of our uh, countries. This year, the pressure on public health systems and the pressure on our budgets did, in a way, divert some of the resources that should have been otherwise invested in climate change mitigation. That's why I think building resilience is an extremely important commitment we need to undertake individually as, 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 as nations, but also multilaterally uh, as the United Nations, as UFM, as uh, other uh, uh, multilateral uh, force. To try to work together to protect and boost the health, environment, social and economic recovery all at once. So while we're doing this, we have to be innovative. We have to deal with today's re reality. We have, in short, to re-examine many long-standing beliefs and reconsider our methodology and what led us to be, to a certain degree, adrift from what we were hoping to achieve in 1995 when we built this partnership. Building resilience, next to rethinking our way, it's also a call for unity because we will not be able to achieve anything if we do not come up with some collective risk. I have so many examples of what we do at the UFM in terms of encouraging our member states to adopt innovative methodology, in terms of integrating cooperation policy uh, into effective links between our member states and mobilizing our political elite to take decisions that will have a region-wide impact and can have region-wide cooperation. I can give some example, but maybe this could be uh, uh, tackled during the question and answer uh, session. But in short, those answers and those methodology and those policy and this mobilization that we try to do are focused on creating a very strong link between climate, energy security, economy, economy, development, and health. This is now the paradigm on which we should concentrate our efforts uh, in the next, uh, I would say, few decades. Why? Climate should be integrated when we're talking pandemic because the climate change challenge is fostering inequality. It's deepening poverty in our society and it has serious health implications. So we need to break the cycle. We cannot deal with one and leave the other. We have to break the cycle that link all those uh, uh, challenges uh, together. And that's exactly is our way of working. This is our built in our DNA to try to create those nexus, this very new nice expression of nexus uh, between different uh, axis of our action that are interrelated in today's world. Let's take a look at the economic recovery and from a purely regional perspective while dealing 
with the challenges our region is facing. We also the limitation of the actual value chain model slash the globalized value chain model that the world has been adopting in the last 30, 40 years. This crisis has shown one, the limitation, and we saw the disruption the pandemic has caused uh, in terms of uh, value chain and the difficulty of relying on factories that are thousands of miles away. And if we combine that with one of the main challenges this uh, region is facing, which is a very low level of regional economic integration, where only 9% of what the EU trades with the world are coming from the southern and eastern Mediterranean region. And even more dramatic, only 1% of trade between southern Mediterranean countries is happening within that southern Mediterranean region. We need to lobby, mobilize, open the eye of the private sector, uh, of IFIs, international financial institutions, into the importance of rethinking the model, of looking at what we call today relocating supply chains closer to home. And by home, and it's very dangerous to say home is the EU, no, home should be the whole Euro-Mediterranean region. That's why we are promoting the idea of relocation of supply chain, what we call today, there is a new word emerging, which is proximization. This could be really a good, <coughs> opportunity for our region. Uh, not alone in terms of its impact on increasing our GDP, reducing our unemployment rate, uh, decreasing the gap between North and South, but also in terms of environmental, and this is where everything is feeding into this nexus. It will have an impact in reducing the carbon footprint of what Europe is trading with the rest of the world. So that's one idea that we are trying to promote. And we're not just promoting politically, but we are creating the science-led data to show that is feasible, possible, profitable, and relevant. So we're working as we speak with the OECD to assess pro pro progress achieved in regional integration and explore the potential to create what we call regional supply Chains. We're also on the side working with our trade ministers, but I don't want to get into details in terms of improving huh? uh, trade condition in terms of rules of origin, but also deal with trade barriers huh? so we can, uh, to a certain degree, uh, uh, encourage uh, the North to do more, but the South also to do export in terms, of course, of encouraging uh, economic growth. Another aspect that the crisis, the COVID pandemic has led to is, of course, its impact on women, low-income households, 
low skilled workers, part time or temporary workers, and of course, the self employed. And again, in unevenly way between north and south of our uh, common sea. And that could lead to one of the points mentioned by Guterres, which is geopolitical rift, because this inequality, this pressure, could lead to promoting a culture of hate, division, could worsen some of the already existing challenge. We have in our region, and that includes Europe, one of the largest of what we call needs, people not in education or employment or trade. So job creation should be also at the heart of what we do in dealing with the COVID-19 impact. Studies are showing that 94% of the worldwide labor force is affected some way or another by company closure uh, and by uh, uh, lockdown. And then another study, it points to the loss of working hours equivalent to 305 million full-time employees. And here again, the importance of what some of our member states are taking in terms of extending safety nets uh, to lessen the impact of confinement measures uh, on uh, uh, their society and to prepare their economy to reopen in a safe and dynamic way. But here we need also to not think outside the box, but to promote different and parallel economic models. One clear example of that would be promoting social economy as an alternative way of delivering economic and social and environmental value, but also as a smart way of unlocking resources, creating sustainable employment, and generating inclusive growth in the region. Today, that sector is quite significant, but not really fully uh, exploited, if I may say so, because it's, it represents 3.2 million enterprises with 15 million jobs. That's quite significant, but it's not uh, as significant as it should be in terms of its capacity to impact our society in a much more positive way. So we need to work harder and more uh, in that sphere. I have here other examples of what we do in the field, but maybe this would be in the question and answer section, what we did in, in terms of promoting job creation in the region, the grants that we gave uh, to small and medium sized initiatives in the field of job creation, but that is more of a technical nature that I would be more than happy to uh, give details if you feel uh, we need to know more uh, about it in terms of what we do uh, to encourage micro, small, and medium sized enterprises and all those uh, in this specific uh, social economy sector or other. Another within that nexus and within the list of priorities, the UN Secretary General have uh, drawn our attention to, there is the issue of gender, which, does, which is not a standalone issue. Actually, some study point if women are fully, if the potential of our women is fully tapped uh, especially in the southern Mediterranean region, but also in the northern uh, rim of, of the Mediterranean, the GDP in, in some part of our region could double in the span of five to six years. 
So this is no longer an ethical issue. It is beyond, it is ethical. There is an issue of dealing with inequalities in terms of GDP growth in our society. But now, this was my usual argument before the crisis. But now with the crisis, this has become even much more dramatic because we are, we are seeing science, not science, proves that women and girls are particularly affected by the economic and social fallout of COVID-19. They are, as we speak, losing their livelihood faster than any other group in the society. Why? Because they are exposed to certain economic sectors that are more hard hit by the crisis than any other. The accommodation, meaning the hotels, the food and beverage, domestic work. One study point, one UN study point that in the Arab world alone, we will, women will lose 700,000 jobs. This is at a time where we have, or we had before the crisis, one of the lowest worldwide percentage of working women, somewhere around 20 to 25 percent. This is happening at the time where unemployment between our women seeking jobs is as high as 43 percent. And not only that, where unemployment is higher, the higher your level of education, the less access to the market. Unprecedented situation. So women with PhDs, with university degrees, have much more difficulty finding jobs today than their men counterparts or women seeking jobs in less, less qualified women seeking jobs in different economic sectors. So gender is at the heart of dealing is at the heart of our should be at the heart of our is that a problem? No. It is at the heart of our effort to deal with the fallout of COVID-19, but also at the heart of our collective effort to create this area of co-prosperity that I mentioned in the beginning of my uh, 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 presentation. Needless to say, and I will go on for a while, we are at our level, at our very modest level, doing our bit in terms of dealing with this situation by our efforts in terms of increasing women economic participation, in terms of improving their skills, in terms of giving them equal access to the labor market, creating a better and an enabling environment for women entrepreneurs, but also dealing with the long standing issue of violence against women and girls, and especially the horrific impact of conflict on the condition of our women and girls. Let alone, of course, the continuous debate about giving women's access to leadership positions on the North and the South of the Mediterranean and dealing with stereotypes affecting women and social norms hindering their full participation in our society. We've done many things, but I, the one thing that we're proud of is that we are creating what I dare to call a peer review mechanism. It's not called that, uh, where for the first time we are trying to have one set of criteria, north and south of the Mediterranean, where we will monitor what, e what each of our country is doing and what it should be doing and uh, push uh, the gender agenda to the top of our member state agenda in the future.
and it is more important today with the current uh, crisis than uh, it is than it was uh, before. Another point I mentioned in the priority of the Secretary General of the UN and mine, or not mine, mine members, our, uh, our member state in the USM is definitely the issue of climate change, which has unfortunately receded from the headlines, except for maybe the last couple of weeks with the very good news of America rejoining uh, the Paris Agreement. And also the fact that the US administration is calling for a new summit, uh, uh, a new planet summit, if I'm not mistaken. I am a firm believer that COVID and the challenges we're facing because of it is an opportunity yeah. for us, as, we, as I say, to build better. But before we talk about that, we have to draw, I need to draw your attention to the specificity of our needs. especially of the Mediterranean, where 60 to 70% of our population in some of our country live around or in the coastal region. And we have a huge concentration of economic activity that is reliant on climate sensitive agriculture. And let and tourism and other other activity that lead to the fact that climate change that we have become or could become in the future one of the climate change hotspots worldwide. Our average annual temperature rise is. 20% higher than the rest of the world, as I mentioned before in my presentation. <coughs> sea levels in the Mediterranean are rising faster than anywhere else in the world, let alone the quality. We see an increasing phenomena of water acidification in our seas. We have 15 mega cities bordering the Mediterranean shores who are at risk of flooding. And this risk could increase in the future. We know that by 2050, if we do not take the necessary mitigation and adaptation measures, 250 million people are expected to be water poor. That's an a huge number of citizens where we would have to find way to provide relief through emergency measures if we do not act now. So in the absence of a globally or regionally coordinated response, the risk of environmental challenges increases tremendously with its impact on the economic, on the economy, and also its impact on our health situation. So the two conclusion I would draw is that we have to deal collectively in terms of committing and implementing what needs to be done in terms of adaptation and mitigation, and we need to rely on scientifically driven solutions. That's why, and by the way, some of the numbers I just gave you are a portion, part of the findings 
of the first ever scientific report on the impact of, of environmental and climate change in the Mediterranean region that was developed by the UFM or with the UFM support. Uh, 80 scientists from across the region, it's called the Medic Network, have been for a few years developing this report with the aim to facilitate a more effective policy response to the challenge of climate change. Plenty, I have in front of me plenty of data, but I will tell you, we can come later to that on the type of challenge we are facing. Uh, and also what we're doing to face that challenge. I mean, just this year alone, we have three ministerial, one just took place last week on the blue economy, which is a very important uh, uh, set of economic activity that are sustainable, that could uh, 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 provide uh, economic uh, uh, dividend growth uh, without impacting the environment, uh, that should provide transport without impacting uh, 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 our environment in terms of maritime cluster, in terms of uh, uh, low emission uh, technology, circular blue economy, we can, uh, in terms of increasing the blue skills in our region, dealing with marine litter, uh, marine renewable ener energy, nature-based tourism. Just last week, we agreed as, as 42 member states on a clear uh, uh, understanding of what needs to be our priority in that sector. In a few weeks, we have an energy uh, 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 ministerial meeting where we discuss our priority and our priority obviously is the one uh, uh, in trying to a certain extent in the European uh, new deal uh, a new green deal I'm sorry which means uh, zero emission by 2000 and here another example where environment economic and regional integration are mixed together. We all know that for us to reach zero emission by 2050, a new technology called green nitrogen needs to be developed. And the technology is there, it needs to be expanded, uh, uh, improved, so it becomes cost effective and it becomes uh, produce at scale. The number one source of energy to produce green nitrogen is the sun, is solar. So if Europe is intended in reaching zero emission by 2050, it's a non-brainer, sorry to be non serious that it has to invest heavily in the production of green nitrogen, not in Germany and not in France, but in North Africa and in the desert area of North Africa, creating jobs, wealth, value added, increased economic integration, lowering the level of CO2 emission in the wider Euro-Mediterranean uh, region. And to be able to implement this vision, we cannot only rely on government, we need to engage the private sector. And I've noticed since I joined this uh, organization that there is a an increasing appetite from the private sector to engage in what we call impact investment. And there is an economic, a valid economic model for making money. And we have experimented ourselves with 
uh, 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 an NGO called Region Regions for Climate Action are 20 and created with them a fund where the previous fund for Latin America proved to have a return on investment that exceeded 10 percent for central project we are doing with them another one uh, where seven or eight of our member states are participating and we are now working on setting up a specialized fund for the Mediterranean in this uh, so in conclusion as I said building result resilience should be at the heart of our action in the future, while keeping this linkage between the many challenges we're facing, because they are related from geopolitical rifts to gender, to climate, to health. Examples are ample in the direct relation between all those factors in making our region less or more stable for the future. So settling for the status quo is definitely not an option. Environmentally speaking, economically speaking, politically speaking, it's not an option. And this pandemic has given, give up, has given us ample examples that building walls is no longer feasible in today's world. As, as people use this expression, the butterfly, butterfly effect, I think this butterfly effect has become the norm today rather than the exception in terms of the interdependence that we are all uh, aware of it or living without being aware. And I'm a firm believing that the Mediterranean could be really uh, the testing ground for new ideas, for new approaches, for integrated solutions, for more multilateral action, although it's a difficult region by its makeup, by the inequality, by its environmental challenge, but more and more in the last few months, I see a greater appetite and more political will between our different member states to try to work together. When I look at the discussion taking place today uh, for the next uh, ministerial we're organizing on climate action and environment, which is taking place in May, the end of May this year, I was expecting lots of tension between developing countries within the UFM and developed countries. And to my surprise, I see an emergent consensus, which makes me believe that we will go to the next Glasgow Earth Summit as a united front. And that front includes Germany, and Mauritania, that's quite an achievement. Huh? Tunisia and Sweden, and all the others. I hope I didn't take uh, very long in my initial presentation. I'll be extremely honored and happy to answer any question, any questions you might have, and I will end up. Thanking you, Professor, for giving me this opportunity and thanking you all for your patience in listening to a diplomat trying to be politically correct. So not very exciting in his presentation eh, compared to other academic uh, professors that we usually do. Thank you very much. Excellency, <clears throat> Excellency, thank you so much. It was very, very mesmerizing and informative. So I'm sure that many questions will come. Uh, uh, they would exceed our plan time, but we will try to, to get to them uh, very quickly. Um, 
what I particularly liked, you, 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 you referred also to reports that, that we are coming before the, the, this uh, latest crisis and also on, on, uh, combined with the views uh, from the organization and your personal views. Um, and you are absolutely right. Uh, 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 the, the current crisis, the, the current pandemic crisis or crisis uh, uh, triggered by pandemic, uh, pandemic is basically only amplifying many of the existing problems. And, and this is, uh, I'm particularly uh, grateful that you, that you enumerated, you went into the length and, and really uh, uh, made a good point uh, for the scholars and also for practitioners of what the pending homeworks we have had and also what, what will now accelerate in, in, the, in the problem solving, what, what, what will come as a need to, to, to solve but also something which came uh, as a specific problem to the, to the Euro Mediterranean. Uh, just quick question before, uh, from my side, before we turn to, 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 to audience. Uh, is it possible to have viable Europe without a strategic dialogue with the, with the, with the Middle East, especially with the North Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. But actually, uh, for uh, an extremely relevant uh, uh, question, I would dare say, is Europe going to be a relevant player economically and politically on the international scene without a dialogue with its southern and eastern neighbors? Although I do not represent the Eastern neighborhood. But what, the more I understood, and I've been working as an Egyptian diplomat in the, in the European Union for at least 25 years, the more I understand Europe, the more I don't see Europe as a geopolitical and an economic powerhouse being able to compete in tomorrow's world if it's not fully integrated and with a very, proactive, dynamic dialogue with the Southern neighborhood and the Eastern uh, neighborhood. I look at this three sub-regions, if I may say so. I know it's strong politically and geopolitically, but I'm just using the term as one block. And that's the only way for this enlarged region to be relevant. I'm not talking about membership in the EU, that's out of the question. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about this, cet espace commun, comme on dit en français, this common uh, uh, space, as the only way out for the three regions to be relevant, to be able to respond to some of the pressing geopolitical tension that we are facing, and to count in a world where we see India, China, and we see America struggling, I might say so, uh, to be relevant uh, and to remain relevant in its current capacity. So yes, the answer, yes, yes, yes. It is strategically important for Europe and equally important for our part of the world. So many are talking now about the, the recalibration or, or rethinking of the transatlantic relationship and, and uh, relationships or relationship. And, and uh, uh, so, so basically you are also uh, calling upon uh, uh, such a recalibration or rethinking uh, when it comes to the Middle East, but also to Eastern Europe. I'm, I'm particularly happy that you, that you brought also this Eastern dimension because yes. Europe, West, East and, and South. Yes, and by the way, I didn't mean by that that Europe should stop. Uh, it's uh, and especially now when we see, uh, <laughs> sorry for being uh, for not being politically correct, we see an American president who and this president who understand the importance uh, of his alliance with uh, with Western Europe. Uh, so I'm not in any way uh, discarding this. This is a very important axis of, of Europe. But the balance. But the balancing. Exactly, exactly. Sir. 100%. And what is also very often forgotten is that, that actually Euro Mediterranean culture is one single culture. 
Europe wants to portray itself uh, uh, as, as based on Judeo-Christianity, but, but both actually religions are originating from the Middle East. They are not, they are not essentially European. So if we talk about the, the civilizational circle or the cradle of Europe, it's in the Middle East. Well, I would dare even say, Professor, that sometimes I have a problem uh, uh, accepting the term Judeo Christian because, frankly, when I look at Islam, the real, true, modern uh, uh, theology of Islam, uh, it is an integral part of that uh, civilizational uh, uh, context. I, I mean, those three, I'm not saying they're better than other religions or, or anything, but those three uh, monotheist uh, religions are drawing their cultural reference and their uh, 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 symbolism from the same source and are actually preaching the exact same message. Forget uh, this aberration that we've been living with in the last uh, 20, 30 years uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, extremism, uh, uh, which have their own geopolitical and economic uh, uh, origin. So yes, the region is uh, the cradle of civilization, as we always say, but also have the same references when it comes, yes, to culture and civilization. Uh, thank you so much. I think we will open now floor uh, to questions. I, I saw some some uh, coming in, in, in written form. Uh, I will read a couple of them, but I'm also uh, asking for the viewers to shortly introduce themselves very briefly and to try to be concise with the questions. So what I see is actually related to the vaccine. But firstly, do we speak about the vaccine or experimental biological substance? This is a big question. I think it's beyond, beyond our knowledge, actually. It's actually referring to Egypt, that Egypt was, was vaccinating very few people. But I think it's, it's beyond today's talk. I, I don't know. And the, the, the fundamental question is, is, is it a really vaccine? Do we have a choice and many other things, you know? Well, listen. But, if you wish to refer to that, it's okay. I can refer to it. I have no problem whatsoever. And and but I will be repeating what uh, what uh, Doctor uh, uh, the WHO uh, Director General had mentioned. We all know that we have an issue today with vaccination. Uh, when you look at the plan uh, of vaccination worldwide, you will find out that. It has become now uh, one of the new dividing lines between the have and the have nots uh, on the international scene. And, and it reflects also a lack of understanding from those who have vis a vis uh, even the pandemic itself. But because the pandemic does not respect borders. So you, you vaccinate your own population, you have India, Egypt, South Africa where the vaccination is much slower, new vari uh, variant of the disease will spread and your vaccine will no longer be uh, sufficient. So you are shooting yourself in the leg. Uh, if we do not multilaterally deal with that, we are only, uh, we're not solving the problem at the national level, let alone at an international level. So, sure. It is. It's. In, it will become. If, if there is no, I see some good signs coming from Washington. Uh, I see uh, uh, the, because when I see Spain where I live buying somewhere in between 140 uh, to 180 million jabs when their population is 40 million, and I know that Egypt has hardly been able to secure two million jabs. It's uh, and when I know that hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people from each country move to the other country every single year. What are we uh, accomplishing here? Huh? So there is an issue. It's not, uh, uh, I, uh, there is an issue and it could become much more acute. We will not go back to the days of pre-pandemic uh, unless we have a collective, again, multilateral uh, response to the issue of uh, 
As for Brexit, um, I would be more than happy if you have any specific question. I was in yes. London, it happened, but I don't know what the question was. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so you are you are basically telling that that also with the vaccination, it will drop in the in the classical lines, as we have of the of of the of the advanced one and and, and those behind. Yes. Um, Many are many are actually uh, uh, comparing, seeing that lack of cooperation on 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 let's say on the development of or on the fight with the, with COVID. Many are explaining uh, or or portraying the 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 vaccine production uh, and lack of this multilateral cooperation as a, as an arm race. And it's pity that that for example we don't have local production that that that. Uh, the best vaccine plan is not disclosed to everyone. It's not in a possession of mankind, and that uh, at least some of the countries locally can produce. I think it would uh, many are many are advocating this or calling the point for that. I'm that not... it does not come from few places because it's also burdened then politically, but that it's locally produced. Yeah, but it's not. I don't see, I can see it as an art race for a very simple reason. An art race, as, as ugly as it is, as it could be, it gives eventually a certain advantage to the country that is ahead of the pack. But in terms of vaccination, the country ahead of the pack does not give, gain any advantage compared to the others, because if we do not collectively create herd immunity based on vaccination, uh, we will be faced with new variants of that disease, which would render the vaccine inefficient. So what are we doing? Uh, unless in one year we are able to rise or raise, to be more accurate, the level of our protection, we will end up having cycles of uh, 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 of, of, of hot spot of infection everywhere in the world with new variants and the need to find out new uh, new uh, new type of vaccine that are efficient. So it's not it's not even viable. It may be viable in the very short term. The first two or three countries that will succeed might be perceived as safer for business tourism uh, than others. But on the mid medium and long term, I think it's not the right strategy. The second point, uh, it is uh, the know-how and the intellectual property. I'm, I'm no expert, by the way, and this is, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud. When I see that, that, uh, that Oxford, AstraZeneca, because of their ethical approach to the matter, their vaccine is, worth, is, 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 uh, is sold at between three and five dollars, when other uh, vaccine are sold at twenty to thirty dollars. Uh, I have to ask my a question: Is it really the cost or a decision of a company to make uh, a, a profit? When I know for a fact, talking to some minister of health uh, in my region, that company would not disclose the price of the vaccine. Uh, uh, they uh, the the price of the vaccine when they sold to a country. Uh, uh, maybe I'm, I'm misspeaking. Uh, uh, the company will not let you know how much they're selling the vaccine in another country. So if with each one of those countries, there is a commercial uh, discussion on pricing. Uh, where are we heading? So meaning, uh, meaning the company makes its decision based on the ability of the country to pay a higher price or a lower price. Uh, uh, when I see that the capacity to produce vaccines in the developing, not developed world, is huge, because actually part of that uh, 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 value chain has led in the last 10 years that most of the production of those vaccines is done actually in India and places similar to India, but we're not sharing the technology to allow Egypt, India, Morocco, uh, Indonesia uh, to mass produce those vaccines. That some issue of governance are at play here, and unless somebody take the lead in Europe or in the US, uh, we're in for uh, for an ugly discussion and for a feeling that this is an arms race and not a collective effort 
to protect humanity from this evil uh, pandemic. Uh, true, uh, even in the EU, so so the, the details, especially the price was not disclosed. It is kept kept away from the from the taxpayers. Anyway, so uh, now I'm opening the floor. Uh, please short introduction and try to be concise with the question. I think we, Mr. Mahmoud wanted to uh, put the question, please. Are you uh, there? Yes. Yes. Thank yes. you, uh, Mr. Anif. Good morning. Uh, uh, your excellency, Mr. Kamal, thank you for your time and your, the quality of your speech. So my name is Chuli Konate. I work for a, consult a consultancy firm. So last year, uh, Mr. Secretary General, more than 20,000 people died, died trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea, according to the United Nations. A few days ago, the Foreign Minister of Spain, Ms. Arantxa Gonzalez, called upon uh, the European Union countries. She asked for an increasing of the funds intended to develop certain countries. So my question to you are very simple, but not that politically correct, I guess. Do you think that uh, European countries have a good approach of the migration problem? And don't you think that opening the money tap is an artificial solution? Furthermore, uh, don't you think that uh, European countries are now facing a backfiring of their own bad uh, geopolitical choices when it comes to migration? I'm thinking about Syria and Libya, especially. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. I'm sorry, I haven't, I haven't catched uh, some part of the question and if I deviate from uh, answering uh, or if my understanding is not the correct one, please, please correct me. Uh, 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 if I'm not mistaken, you were asking if the EU approach to immigration uh, uh, is the right uh, one, uh, 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 or if it has led uh, to uh, uh, complicate the issue uh, furthermore. Am I right or wrong? Uh, you kind of right. I'm, I'm, I'm talking especially about the, uh, the solution that consists in opening the money tap and giving much more fun to the southern countries. And do you think that that's a good approach? Because to me, it's kind of artificial to think that by giving them more money, they're going to be developed locally and that uh, that way we are going to contain the migration flow. To me, that's kind of a corporate solution, let's say. You mean tackling, tackling migration by investing into, into the creation of jobs in the, in the sending countries? This is what you meant. Yes, because the problem because is Because it, it uh, would be cheaper and wiser to do this. Yes, kind of. Thank you. Well, well, well I, would, I would try to answer to the best of my ability. And uh, uh, from what uh, I, I gathered, uh, the sounds wasn't very clear. Well, let me, let me start by saying, and this is uh, a critic, a, 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 I mean, I will be criticizing to a certain extent uh, the European approach. The European approach would have been for a while actually focused on the management uh, of, of migration uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, the economic uh, uh, dimension uh, of, that, uh, of, that, of that challenge. Europe in the last 10 years has been more uh, uh, focusing on uh, 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 managing the flow uh, from the south to the north, and also how to manage those who manage at the end to land in Europe in terms of uh, 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 burden sharing within the EU, uh, uh, in terms of accommodating those uh, new arrivals. Uh, very little has been done on, uh, uh, on the economic front and some of even the financial incentives that were given at certain cases uh, were not given to deal with the issue of migration but were, were given as an incentive to certain countries to do more in terms of policing. I'm being very uh, uh, blunt in terms of better policing and better controlling their territorial water or their borders. Uh, 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 so uh, we could stop the flow 
uh, or reduce the flow uh, uh, of migrants. Uh, I haven't seen a concerted effort in terms of dealing with the root causes, uh, be it uh, economic, be it in some cases environmental. I mean, some, some study will point out even to the fact that the total collapse of Syria was not only an issue of democracy, was also related to climate change to a certain extent. The agricultural base of the Syrian economy was already facing some existential challenge before uh, the economic, uh, the political, political uh, 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 the, the political dimension of that crisis became uh, apparent. Uh, uh, so again, to what I said in my presentation, investing uh, economically, uh, environmentally, uh, in terms of helping country with their mitigation adaptation, uh, in terms of, uh, as I said, in terms of the renewable energy and its, uh, its impact on job creation, creating a, a stronger economic uh, base that is economically beneficial definitely will have its own uh, 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 impact on, reduce, on reducing uh, uh, and dealing with uh, 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 the uh, flow, uh, those flows uh, of, 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 uh, of migrants trying to cross the Mediterranean in search of uh, a better life. Uh, let not, let's not also, and I will add another point, maybe food for thought for, for another question or a future discussion, uh, the demographic imbalance between the north and the south of the Mediterranean is also another source of pressure. Because let's not forget that 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 one of the reasons for this migration is 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 although the government are 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 are, 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 are trying their hard to limit uh, the economies of those countries is is in a sense allowing and creating an environment uh, that allows migrants once they reach those countries to settle and find jobs because of. Uh, the declining uh, uh, demography of those countries uh, and uh, uh, the increasing demand, especially on the low skill uh, side of the economy for uh, uh, people coming uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa uh, to work in the North. So I'm 100% uh, with you on, on saying uh, a comprehensive approach, one that is uh, creating uh, opportunities for economic growth uh, is a much better approach than one that focuses solely on controlling the flows uh, with border uh, control and policing and other measures of this sort. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we, have, uh, we have another question, uh, which uh, first of all praised uh, uh, your take on, on youth and the job creation in the Euro-Mediterranean uh, basin or theater. And, and the question relates essentially on the discrepancy in a way that the Middle Eastern side of, of, of Mediterranean is dominated by young and not well mobilized uh, population. And on the other side, we have in Europe, actually the elder population, which is well situated. <clears throat> so the Middle Eastern side dominated by the young, sometimes angry and unemployed, uh, male dominated population. And on the other side, well situated female population on the European or the EU side. And that, that itself has no balances. And then bottom line, so how we can, actually, uh, uh, let's say, help and enhance the cross-generational contract, which is also falling behind in Europe as well. So practically, this cross-generational enhancement becomes a problem all over. Well, what you just said is a statement which I totally agree with, so uh, more than an answer in the sense that what you said is 100% correct. Uh, except maybe when you say male dominated, I, I wouldn't 100% agree with you because uh, women uh, uh, and 
young girls uh, actually statistic are pointing out a very interesting fact is that uh, the uh, uh, percentage of uh, uh, women uh, in higher education in our society is higher society by its, our society I mean the southern Mediterranean is higher than the percentage of men uh, in higher education so the number of uh, PhD, uh, master degrees, uh, university degrees uh, in our uh, uh, part of the world is higher. And women uh, were at the forefront, and we've seen them physically uh, at the forefront of the uh, Arab Spring in 2011, uh, and actually <laughs> represented more of the violent, more frustrated uh, segment of those youth who went into the street asking for a better future because they are more, uh, 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 because of the gender situation in our society, so they feel doubly uh, disadvantaged by the inequality in the society at large, and then the way they are treated uh, uh, in a less favorable way than their uh, male uh, uh, counterpart in the same society. So, yeah, but the gender, not the gender imbalance, the generational imbalance is obvious. Huh? Uh, we talk about 65 to 70 percent of our uh, uh, population under the age of 30 or even 25, while you have the exact same opposite uh, situation uh, uh, in Northern Europe. That leads me back to this very basic idea, unless Europe rethink its economic model uh, with the Southern Mediterranean. Uh, where a transfer of certain labor intensive uh, uh, activities, uh, where, as I said, uh, 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 this idea of bringing uh, value chain uh, closer to home, uh, this very new expression of proximization uh, uh, is, 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 is taken seriously, where the new Green Deal and all the investment coming with it and all the ambition integrates the wider region and not focus because uh, on, 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 uh, on, on, on solely uh, the EU uh, to be able. And once you have created enough momentum for more economic growth and with it comes education uh, uh, and comes a, a larger and an emerging middle class uh, the demographic issue tends to uh, uh, solve itself slowly and gradually. We have seen it historically. Uh, 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 we've seen it even in Europe. If you look at Spain in the 30s and 20s, uh, in terms of, uh, of, 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 of fertility rate, and you look at Spain today, uh, uh, it's obvious that a country like Tunisia, even Tunisia, because Tunisia was doing very well uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s in terms of economic growth and in terms of an emerging middle class, they did not face a demographic uh, issue uh, the same uh, way a country like Egypt or Morocco did because they were not faring as well uh, as Tunisia uh, did. Today, if you look at the number in Tunisia, you will notice a jump. Uh, in, 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 in demography due to socioeconomic issues that they are facing today. So what I'm saying in short, not to take a long time, one is a multilateral and an EU-led approach, and not by, say, by that saying transfer uh, of resources or, or assistance. I'm, saying, I'm talking about investment, uh, which will bring back wealth and prosperity to Europe, uh, uh, but will change the dynamics of the economic equation in the South and in the mid to long term to change even the whole demographic uh, makeup of the South and help deal with the challenges Europe is, is facing uh, on the demographic front. I don't know if I was clear in my answer or not. No, I think I think it was brilliant. So, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Tunis was was since you mentioned Tunis, since Tunis was the first uh, Muslim and Arab country that went into so-called demographic transition. Exactly. 
So, so at, at, at some point, I think in 90s. Uh, the, 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 the next question is related to what we talked, uh, why Europeans have uh, outsourced their, their, their businesses to China, but not to Middle East. Can you repeat again? Why Europeans or why West was, uh, was uh, outsourcing their industries to China, but not to the Middle East? I think referring that it should be practically a, 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 in, a, in, a, in a courtyard. So, so it's so close and, and they've been dislocating it so far. Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not economic. Uh, we should uh, ask Europeans maybe. No, <laughs> but yeah, but it is obvious to me and I'm sure to yourself and your, uh, your guests that, that definitely economically speaking, it was cheaper to outsource uh, certain of uh, certain part of Europe needs uh, uh, by having them manufacture in China, then in the Middle East, yeah, uh, because the social uh, uh, protection level, uh, even uh, uh, in China compared to North Africa, is quite different. The 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 the, the, the pay gap was was quite big uh, uh, twenty years ago. But when we look closer today, uh, 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 and also uh, the ability of the Chinese to mass produce, uh, uh, I mean, uh, and the fact that uh, uh, environmental considerations were not respected, uh, 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 emission uh, and footprint, carbon footprint uh, uh, of certain uh, production center were not really uh, looked at. So, we have tended to overlook so many of the big ideas that we are defending eh? because uh, uh, from a cost benefit uh, point of view it was better to produce in china but if we want or if we are serious about uh, 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 sustainability eh? uh, at large environmental and other eh? uh, it is definitely makes definitely much more sense uh, to produce in uh, the south uh, of the EU and in the eastern uh, neighborhood uh, of the EU. It is being done more, I, I mean, look at Czech Republic uh, before and after joining the EU uh, and how the Czech Republic is back being uh, uh, an economic powerhouse uh, and how many of, of, of the large uh, 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 automakers and others in the EU are uh, uh, moving to there. Uh, they're not cheaper than China, but they were another logic to it. The same logic should apply to Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, and Eastern Europe for that matter. And we need to be more serious and, and respect uh, our promises for a more responsible, sustainable, uh, emission, uh, low emission uh, model of economic development. Uh, yes, please. Uh, the next question, I think we have uh, someone from audience coming, uh, uh, audio. Please. So I think students are shy to ask. So one, one also one, one question which is coming uh, on uh, on the on the text. Uh, uh, do you do you do you do you believe that uh, the the change comes with the new American administration, and how it uh, might affect Euro Mediterranean? The change. The change of administration in, in, in Washington, the new uh, US administration. Yes. Well, uh, what, uh, 100%, uh, I, believe, I believe that uh, this new administration, uh, first, when it comes to Europe, and it was obvious in the first uh, couple of weeks uh, uh, that uh, this administration uh, is in. Uh, is uh, intend to renew its uh, its alliances and partnership 
uh, with uh, uh, their Western allies in, in the EU, which means they would be eventually um, uh, more aligned with the EU priorities when it comes to the uh, uh, Middle East, uh, which will mean uh, uh, that uh, uh, those priorities, including uh, human rights, uh, will play an important uh, component uh, uh, in terms of uh, US EU policy towards the region, uh, the need to tackle some of the pressing uh, uh, geopolitical rifts. Uh, and the administration started by talking about Yemen, because maybe this was an obvious case uh, uh, in comparison to uh, the bigger issue of, uh, of the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, program. Uh, I would uh, expect uh, an administration that will not necessarily engage aggressively uh, in trying uh, to deal with those threats, uh, uh, because they have the bigger challenge of dealing with the pandemic again uh, within their own uh, soil, uh, but uh, they will be definitely uh, more engaged than the previous one uh, in other in theater in the Middle East, be it Syria, be it Libya, be it Yemen, uh, and maybe at the later stage. Uh, I don't expect it to happen in the. In the, in, the, in the foreseeable future, maybe at a later stage uh, uh, in the front of the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. But definitely this will be an administration that will have uh, a unified approach, uh, a, a technocratic, because those in charge uh, are experts in foreign policy. The choices of name are extremely encouraging. So in that sense, uh, uh, I could see an engagement, but I don't expect it to happen uh, immediately because America has the, a lot on its plate internally uh, to deal with. But uh, we will uh, definitely see a much more dynamic administration maybe in six months to one year uh, from now. Uh, one, one more question coming from, from, uh, from the writing side. Although I would also like to, to have someone uh, audio. Uh, the question is actually, uh, we are witnessing overlapping pro uh, um, promulgation of economic zones on the sea. What is your take or what is the organizational take on, on that? I don't have a specific take on that, but uh, in my view, the, the, the international maritime law is clear. Uh, and does it need to be reinterpreted? Uh, we all know uh, what it entails. Uh, so my advice, uh, and nobody asked for it actually, <laughs> uh, 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 we do not need to reinvent uh, the wheel. Uh, the question was actually formulated in a very diplomatic way, but let's uh, call it state a state. It is the problem of the East Med uh, in general and, uh, and, and the tension between some of the UFM member states uh, over uh, territorial, territorial water, uh, which is a very funny expression. Uh, 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 and the answer here is obvious. International maritime law is very clear when it comes to uh, your ter territorial water and your what we call exclusive economic uh, zone. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, country have to show some flexibility and try to accommodate each other. But it's obvious that this region is becoming uh, increasingly uh, an important production center of gas, which is definitely not a renewable energy by no means, but it's one of the least polluting in terms of traditional ones. So its lifespan is expected to be longer than other source of traditional energy. So uh, the whole uh, region and beyond, we see countries beyond the region. I remember this new East Med uh, forum that was created by Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Cyprus, and Greece. I see France 
applying to be a member. I see the US wanting to be observer. I see the United uh, uh, Arab Emirates uh, asking. So it points to the emerging uh, importance of that region in terms of its impact on the energy market uh, in the Euro Mediterranean region. Because gas is not necessarily a commodity that is transported. It is, but it's not usually transport, transported tens of thousands of miles away from where it's produced. But it is, because America is actually exporting gas all the way uh, to the Middle East sometimes. But uh, it's not the North. So the difference should be solved uh, within the international maritime law. And there is structure, and we should resort to those structures. Uh, the, the International uh, Court of Justice or others to deal with those type of uh, of interpretation of where my uh, water, territorial water starts and where my neighbor uh, territorial water ends. They are also, I mean, when, when talking about UNCLOS, they are, they are still pending, uh, let's say, uh, border issue, uh, 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 maritime issues between Greece and, and Turkey, Croatia and Slovenia, Croatia and Bosnia. There are several of them still still going on on the on the Euromed region. So, but but essentially, you are not you are not involved into that. I would definitely not try to be involved in that uh, uh, because for uh, let's not forget and uh, in all honesty that this is not the only uh, point of contention. We have so many other issues. Uh, within our uh, or between our member states, the Arab Israeli conflict, uh, the Western Sahara between uh, Morocco and uh, Algeria. In Algeria, yes. And others and others, for example, are about. I'm more uh, trying to work on where we agree on and, and trying to steer away for now from where we don't agree on. Of course, on informal basis, I do speak to those to, to, to different. Uh, uh, High officials, but institutionally speaking, we're not really that involved here. Uh, one more question: Should Euromed uh, nations have double uh, possibility of double citizenship? Well, some do, some don't. I don't have an opinion on that. Uh, most of the southern Mediterranean countries are allowing this 100%. Uh, Morocco, all the way to to Jordan, it's perfectly legal. Uh, in Europe, some do. If I'm not mistaken, I think France does. Uh, Germany doesn't. Uh, uh, so it's it's a matter of uh, of national. Uh, uh, it's a matter of sovereignty, but it has not hindered uh, because those who have chosen, those from the south who have chosen to settle in Germany, did uh, did have to make a choice at a certain point, and some of them chose to. To renounce their uh, original nationality, the U.S. also does not allow. It. So it's it's really it's really based on national policy. No, we don't have an opinion on this. Uh, so that means that that some sort of the Schengen zone on Euro Mediterranean would be a better solution. Uh, yeah, but these are two completely two different issues. Of course. Of course. But, I mean, not necessarily Schengen, but making it easier uh, 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 for people to move from north to south. Because we have talked, we have talked about migration, and maybe I forgot. We need also to, instead of only focusing on controlling illegal, uh, because we have to define things, we have to encourage legal uh, 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 movement for business, for uh, for for uh, academia, for uh, research, uh, for uh, and for work when the needs uh, is there. And we see very successful example of it. One of them is a very nice example where, where Spain uh, every year uh, 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 with the cooperation of Morocco, a few thousand uh, Moroccan uh, workers come and spend six months in Spain helping uh, during the uh, agricultural season. Uh, and the program has been working uh, magnificently well for the last 10 years, except actually this year, because after they came to Spain, they were stuck uh, 
because of travel restrictions, but this is just a blip. Uh, so we need also to regulate legal migration or legal exchange of manpower that does not uh, create necessarily uh, uh, permanent uh, residence for those coming to work for three or six or nine months. Uh, I've been, of course, uh, advocating for, since I took, uh, uh, I started my mandate for a much ambitious uh, Erasmus Mediterranean. There is one, but it's no way uh, close to what uh, the EU Erasmus looks like. We are just an insignificant fraction of what the European program, which in my view is one of the major uh, and most important achievements of the EU uh, when we look at how it created a European Union with a very strong sense of belonging uh, uh, to that continent. I remember when I was ambassador in London, one the number one reason for anxiety between young British uh, citizens regarding Brexit was the fact that they might be excluded from Erasmus. Uh, this is how important uh, 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 bringing young students uh, from the Euro Mediterranean zone closer to each other, bringing people from the north to the south and vice versa, is definitely a key to unlocking so many issues and problems we, co we could face in the future. Uh, thank you. So how is your cooperation with the OSCE, which is a cross-European organization, but also has this uh, 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 Mediterranean dimension? We Several are, Mediterranean countries are also... Yeah, we are partner in crime. I work, uh, we work on daily, not daily, I'm exaggerating, but we work on weekly basis with the Secretary General, who is a dear friend of mine. I attend regularly their ministerial uh, meetings uh, on uh, their Mediterranean uh, partnership. I'm a permanent speaker at their uh, Foreign Minister Forum for the Mediterranean uh, Partners. They attend our meeting. We have three or four uh, ongoing programs. One of the most exciting ones we're working together to define. And that takes me back to what uh, I said in the beginning uh, on the nexus, on the relation between climate change and, uh, and, uh, and uh, stability, uh, geopolitical stability. Uh, and it's obvious. So in the OSC, it's a second dimension. They have a so-called second dimension, which is environment in the OSC. So I'm partnering with them uh, in working on this dimension when it comes to my region in defining where we have hotspots in terms of climate change that could have geopolitical implication on the overall stability of our region. So OSC is a, is a, is a, is a beautiful uh, organization with which I have a strong strategic relation. Uh, and, uh, and the same goes with the Parliamentarian Union for Mediterranean, correct? There is also Parliamentarian Union. It's part of our ecosystem. I mean, they are part of us and we are part of them. Uh, uh, so we work very close. In a normal year, I would go to Strasbourg at least three or four times. Uh, uh, I have uh, direct contact with Sassoli, the head of the European Parliament, who happens to be also the head of the Union for the Mediterranean Parliamentary Assembly. So this is, and we have also other uh, partners uh, 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 in our ecosystem. We have the Euro Mediterranean Association of, uh, uh, in, uh, of uh, Industry. We have, of course, uh, uh, Med Cities, which are uh, uh, the cities. Uh, and uh, uh, local uh, entity in the Mediterranean. We have uh, this whole Barcelona process have flourished in the last 25 years. Uh, I, I do not even, I'm unable to recall all the name of the organization that uh, are part of our ecosystem because they have uh, ranging from women to youth to local uh, and regional and cities to business, to industry, to parliaments, what have you. Uh, and that's the beauty because the more you involve the stakeholder and not only the government uh, in creating this sense of common destiny 
uh, uh, and common objectives, the more you could achieve. We work very hard on creating direct link between regions. And we work very close with the European program CBC, cross-border cooperation. I don't know uh, if you're familiar with. Eh? So we are uh, working very close with them to create a, a direct link between northern of Morocco, southern of Spain, uh, France and, uh, and, 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 and Algeria, uh, Italy and, and Egypt. Uh, it's important. So we, because we don't think that cooperation should be limited to central government in the capital of our member state. So we try here and there to create this uh, uh, community uh, 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 of Mediterranean working for the same uh, goal and to create a community that believe in the same uh, project. For me, one of the most important things that we do besides the institutional uh, government to government uh, dialogue is actually working with the civil society and the stakeholders. Yeah, with the academia. I'm, I'm particularly uh, glad that you mentioned the, the very successful exchange programs. And I fully agree that, that it should be cross Mediterranean and that we all uh, should be giving a contribution that, that the Erasmus and Socrates programs become the cross, uh, the, the cross uh, uh, Euro Mediterranean program soon. Uh, what, is, what, is, what is your take on, on African Union and Arab League? Uh, how is the cooperation with them? Uh, very good. I, uh, I know this will not please uh, the Secretary General of the Arab League or the friend of mine. I, I cooperate more with the African Union than I do with the Arab League. Uh, although uh, the number of member states who, of the UFM who are members of the Arab League is larger than, than, than the one uh, who are member of the African Union. Uh, for a very simple reason, the African Union has a very ambitious economic, environmental, infrastructure, transportation, uh, 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 free trade, uh, uh, much more ambitious agenda in those fields. Uh, so there is lots of area of potential cooperation. Uh, the Arab League has been bogged down by the geopolitical uh, tension uh, list. So as much as I have an idea, and I consider the Secretary of the Arab League one of my mentors in my career, uh, so I have direct access uh, to him, but we do less technically speaking. Of course, they are part of our system, and we attend regularly our uh, foreign ministers' meeting, but I do more uh, on sectoral activity with the African Union than with the Arab and when it comes to the developmental uh, uh, entities and agencies, be it of the EU or African Development Bank or Islamic Development Banks, uh, so, so do, they, do they also, uh, uh, what is the take? So what is the cooperation? Well, it's more than the African uh, Development Bank and the uh, Islamic Development Bank. I work with all uh, the EU uh, I have seen and uh, please switch off the, co the the mic, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now it's okay. Now it's okay. Yeah. Uh, I work with the EDRD. Uh, I work with EID uh, to the extent that they have uh, a representative uh, uh, resident here in uh, my headquarters. And I work, of course, with EDD, African Development Bank, and with. IDB, uh, Islamic Development Bank. Uh, uh, one of the beautiful examples is that the four of them uh, were uh, actually, uh, they carried a big, uh, they did the heavy lifting in financing uh, one of the UFM leading projects, which is the uh, desalination plant they are building in Gaza. Uh, actually, the finance came from those four. And actually, the largest contributor among the four was the IDB, the Islamic Development Bank, and the EU Commission itself, uh, uh, beside the others. So yes, uh, uh, we do work with this uh, with those, and also uh, I need not to forget the World Bank, uh, uh, that is also uh, uh, very uh, solid, and UNDP. UNDP, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, which is a very, very, very reliable uh, 
partners of the USM in so many of our activities, include, and of course, with UN women when it comes to gender. We do have an extensive network of partnership and cooperation with our friends. Yeah, uh, in the US. So if there are no other questions, since we are very close to have two hours of talk, we would be closing for today. Excellency, thank you so much. It was very, uh, let's say, uh, content intensive. It was informative. It was good and foresighting. And uh, I'm very happy that we will have it recorded and uh, put on a, on a website so that more participants will join uh, uh, by viewing it uh, because it was excellent, definitely. And I'm sure that it will inspire many of the research. And by this, I'm also inviting our scholars, also fellow professors, but students, and also diplomats based in Geneva, because I know that they are also following us today to follow issues of Euro-Mediterranean and I'm sure that uh, Cabinet of Secretary General will be uh, very happy to provide with any information if you are working on a research on a master, PhD, bachelor thesis, because we have to popularize those issues. And by uh, writing your own thesis, you are helping yourself, but also the common cause. Excellency, thank you so much. Thank you all participants in Geneva and elsewhere for being with us today and um, we uh, will see each other uh, rather soon thank you very very much thank you. we think differently 